Persia. There was a time in the 1980s when we thought that Iran is going to get uh, destroyed by Iraq and yet mysteriously since the 1990s and since the, uh, the Iraqi war uh, Iraq has been pretty much uh, destroyed as, a, as a, a viable country and a viable threat for the moment and this has coincided with the practical catapulting of Iran to the very centre of the world stage. Who would have expected this? Who would have thought of it? Well now in the Talmud, in tractate Avodah Zorah, the very opening of Avodah Zorah discusses the Mishnah that says for three days before the festival of the nations we are not allowed to do business with them, the festivals of the idolaters, three days before Yom Edam, the Mishnah speaks about that day of destruction as a pejorative way of referring to the idolaters' festivals. And this brings the Talmud into a discussion of the final downfall of the nations. The very beautiful, dramatic Agada there in the first pages of Abu Zorah describing how at the end of days God says, well now the time is up, only those who labored before the Shabbat will be able to eat on, of the, uh, the goodness of Shabbat. So now nations tell me, each one of you, what you did for the welfare of the world. And the first nation to step forward is Edom, saying, look at us, we've built uh, bathhouses, we've built streets, we've built roads, and everything we did was for the benefit of your people Israel, give us our reward. And God says, you, you, you made uh, marketplaces uh, which were filled with prostitutes and you, uh, you built roads in order to have your armies going from place to place to dominate everybody. And you didn't do anything for the people of Israel. Get out of here. Well, now, the second nation to stand up is Paras. And Paras again gets up and says, well, uh, we did this for Israel, we did that for Israel, and they also get thrown up, thrown out. And the Tosfos on that uh, page, that base on the base of the Zorah, says that Paras will be a player on the international stage at the end of time. The Malchus Paras will extend until the end of days. I would not have had the goal to speak about tonight's subject at all had it not been for the Lubavitch Rebbe, Zechet Tzadikid Brocha. But for me, living in Israel in 1989, 1990, 1991 was the single most powerful source of inspiration as in the run-up to the Gulf War we were wondering if Israel was going to attack, get attacked by chemical weapons, by biological weapons. And it was the Lubavitcher Rebbe who was uh, in Sicha after Sicha emphasizing Israel is going to be the safest place and uh, you must have uh, trust and faith in Hashem and everything's going to be okay. And it was a trauma in many ways, the Gulf War, there were 39 Scud missiles and yet the loss of actual human life was limited in the extreme and thank God the anger came out on stones and uh, wood but not on people. I was told that in one sikh of the Lubavitch Rebbe explained what gave him the goal to connect what is going on in the world with the Tyra and he said well uh, it's like if a giant is walking and on the head of the giant there's a little midget who's sitting on his head the midget can actually see further ahead on the road than the giant and so it was that the Rebbe himself felt himself to be the midget sitting on the Friedrich Rebbe and on the previous Rebbe's and uh, because he was sitting on the head of the, uh, the top he was able to see just that little farther ahead. And the Rebbe in the Sikhs of those years many times referred to the Midrash that I'm not going to read, which seems to be more relevant than ever. It's found in a Midrash called the Yalkut Shimoni. The Yalkut Shimoni, the word Yalkut means a satchel or a bag, and Shimoni, it was the, uh, the satchel of a rabbi known as Shimon who lived in Frankfurt around the time of Rashi about a thousand years ago of whom we know nothing more except that he left us 
the most comprehensive midrash on the entire five books of Moses, on the entire Nevi'im and the Ksubim, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, the Alkut collects together every possible place where a certain verse is mentioned throughout the Talmudic literature, the Midrashic literature, has it all on the page for you in order. So chapter 60 of Isaiah is a chapter that speaks like many places in Isaiah about Moshiach and there Yalkut Shimoni brings the following Midrash. Now the, the Midrashim that Yalkut Shimoni is bringing were coming down from rabbis who lived at least 800 years earlier. In the year in which King Moshiach is revealed, all the kings of the world will be fighting one another. The king of Persia will fight the king of Arabia, and the king of Arabia will go to Aram to seek advice from them. The king of Persia will then destroy the whole world, and all the nations of the world will be raging in turmoil and will fall on their faces. Pangs will take hold of them like the birth pangs of a woman giving birth. Israel will be in tumult and turmoil, asking, where shall we go? Where shall we go? And the Holy One, blessed be He, will say to them, do not be afraid. Everything I have done, I have done only for your sake. Why are you afraid? Do not fear, for the time of your redemption has arrived, and the last redemption will not be like the first redemption, because after the first redemption you suffered pain and were subjected to the nations, but after the last redemption you will suffer no further pain or subjection to the nations. Now, the Lubavitcher Rebbe often referred to the beginning part of the Midrash that says that all of the kings of the world will be fighting one another and we see that today, we see that North Korea is against uh, Japan and against America and that uh, Iran is against Europe, not to speak of Israel and uh, Venezuela is boiling against the US, everywhere we see everybody is, uh, is uh, and the king of Persia will fight the king of Arabia, well we can certainly see that in our current uh, affairs that the conflict between the Shiite Muslims and the Sunni Muslims is a conflict between uh, Iran and Arabia and it would appear that Saudi Arabia is at least as scared, if not more so, of Iran than anybody else, and also the Emirates. And the king of Arabia will go to Iran to seek advice from them. Well, actually, it happened last year that the king of Saudi Arabia, for the first time ever, went to visit the Pope in the Vatican. And uh, if there's any candidate to be Iran, that is either Rome specifically or those nations that inherited the mantle of Rome to rule the world. I spoke earlier about the overtures of the present uh, president of USA to the Muslim world. And I would like to emphasize that this is something that has now come to the fore from the government of the USA but uh, for somebody in Britain, this is no chidush whatever. This is uh, nothing new about this. The alliance between the, the uh, European governing elite and the Arabs goes back uh, many, many decades. I referred to it earlier when I spoke about how the British set up Saudi Arabia and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. <coughs> and uh, if you follow carefully the news that comes out of Buckingham Palace, you can... Uh, you can see, if you read between the lines, the, uh, the, 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 the very high rate of meetings between members of the royal family and the uh, leaders of the Emirates and the uh, Saudi uh, ruling elite. And uh, enormous gifts of jewels and uh, personal gifts have been showered by the Arabs and the British royal family. And uh, so what we are seeing from the American administration today is simply a more public expression of what has actually been under the surface one of the uh, governing lines of, of, of the policy of the Western elite to be chummy with the uh, Saudi Arabia and the uh, Emirates. And the king of Persia will then destroy the whole world and all the nations of the world will be raging in turmoil, turmoil and will fall on my faces. I was growing up in the 1950s and uh, 
was beginning to become politically aware in the early 1960s, and my father, 